I'm going to begin this review with a couple of messages. Though my preference is very much for long things, I'll try and keep these short. The first is to the people who will disagree, not necessarily with the points made in this review, but rather with the premise of this review. That premise being that Star Trek Discovery is a garbage show that has replaced all notions of plot, story, and character with discount diversity seminars in a very expensive setting. I know you're out there, and I hope a few of you at least will stick around for this part of the video. I make no apology for having strong views on this subject, and nor should you, but we should, I think, do so with at least a basic understanding of each other's positions. Mine has been set out in our previous videos, and it will likely be set out again at some point in this one, but I wanted to try at least first to head off one form of response in particular, the response which runs something like, you Republicans slash conservatives just don't like seeing women and or brown people and or gay people and or trans people front and center. You just don't like shows dealing with social justice. You're just bigoted old white men mad that the world has left you behind. For the avoidance of doubt, I don't say and I won't say that this is the only form of criticism I have seen or the only form that I expect to see. But it's common enough in the comment sections of our videos and on social media more broadly as to be worthy of a preemptive response. You might choose not to listen to it, but at least I can't be accused of not treating you like thinking human beings. I'm not going to demand or expect the same treatment in return, though it would be courteous. I hate doing the speaking as a this, that or the other, but it is the language many of you seem to speak, and you don't seem to realize that the vast majority of people elsewhere in the world people that is outside America, except where they've been culturally colonized by America, do not speak in this way. But since you do, and I am addressing this point to you, speaking as a not old, not conservative, not republican, not straight person, your presuppositions are incorrect. They contradict the other strain of response I aim here to head off, and that we'll deal with more fully when we get to the section concerning Stacey Abrams and why her cameo is, put blandly? deeply regrettable. That response tends to go, Star Trek has always been political, and then leads into, because you're a bigoted straight white republican slash conservative male who hates brown female trans gay people. The contradiction is this. In this video, and in our previous videos, we've framed our opposition to Star Trek Discovery by highlighting the ways its approach to political and social issues differs from that of old Star Trek series. Our criticisms of Discovery both stems from and entails a defense, a reaffirmation, of what Star Trek used to do. Put simply, the argument is this. Yes, Star Trek has indeed always been political. And yet, here we are, defending old Star Trek. Therefore, our opposition to Discovery cannot be rooted in base prejudice and bigotry, because in defending old Star Trek, we are defending what you yourself claim, rightly, was always a political show. Our problem is not, therefore, that we think Star Trek has just now become political. It's with the form of its politicking. Our contention is that modern Star Trek, in particular Discovery and Picard, does a terrible disservice to the issues of race, of politics and of justice that the franchise has indeed always tackled. Our assertion is that modern Trek New Trek, if you like, has ditched the liberal or progressive universalism of old, the one that spoke to people of all parties and ideologies, religious beliefs, social attitudes, sexual orientations, and political stances, in favor of a particular strain of campaigning leftism that aims to exclude, and that succeeds in excluding, vast numbers of those same people. While old Star Trek campaigned for change by stressing common themes, ideals, and values, elevating politics above the partisan hackery of political demagogues and their corrupt and polarizing parties, New Trek campaigns for those same parties, endorses those same political demagogues, and repeats boilerplate woke messaging like an incantation. As our comment section will attest, this is offensive to people on the left as well as on the right. This is offensive to black people as well as white people. This is offensive to gay and trans people as well as to straight people. Again, for the avoidance of doubt, I am not saying it is offensive to all such people. My entire point is to counter what I take to be your presupposition, 
which I'm sorry to say, seems to be that all human complexity can be boiled down to two moral poles or absolutes, those on the right side of history who agree with you and vote Democrat, and those on the wrong side. If you're more than 12 years old, you shouldn't need to be told this, but I know plenty of people born as I was in the 1990s who still think like this. Hell, I know people in their 60s who think like this. We are a brilliantly diverse species with complex societies and fascinating and often very difficult histories. Our defense of Old Trek is precisely that it recognized and respected this and that that respect allowed it to treat seriously, intelligently, technically and morally with the very issues of social justice you are concerned about today. My second message then is to those in our audience who agree with my position. I've made assertions here and it is usually good form in any argument whatever YouTube comment sections might suggest to you, to provide evidence to back them up. Now, I could come up with a list of old Star Trek episodes that prove the points I've just made, that deal seriously and sensitively and intelligently with the issues I've mentioned, race, sexuality, war and peace, criminal and social justice, much more seriously, sensitively and intelligently than Star Trek Discovery has shown itself to be capable of. But one of the many advantages of having an audience is I've discovered since we started this channel that you are surrounded by people who know much more about what you're talking about than you do. It sometimes makes me feel a little bit silly pontificating about the merits of old Trek when, compared to some of our subscribers, I know so very little about it. My knowledge is comparatively general. So, to our friends and comrades in the audience, you're in a better position to back up my argument than I am, which is a peculiar position for me to be in, so I invite you to do so. If each of you names one episode of Old Trek in the comments that you think stands as a particularly splendid example of the proper handling of these issues, we'll quickly build up a list, a long one I'm sure, I hope at any rate, to serve as an example. Not only will we remind ourselves and perhaps introduce each other to episodes we hadn't seen or perhaps that we hadn't fully appreciated before, we'll also be able to offer this list to those viewers who were mistaken in their understanding of our motives and perhaps demonstrate to them to you, viewer, if you're disagreeing with us in good faith, that we despise discovery not because it champions social and political issues and marginalized peoples, but because it does it badly. I think that'd be a profitable thing to do. Of course, there might be people who disagree in bad faith or who see Star Trek as a propaganda tool for their own party political preferences, and who'll just respond, haha, you hate black people, lol. And to these people I say, fuck off. I said I was going to keep that brief, and to me that was indeed perfunctory, which probably explains why this video is so long, but we'll move on from that now. The bulk of the review that follows will be concerned with the flaws of Season 4 of Star Trek Discovery, flaws in writing, in plot, and in acting, and will not, for the most part, dwell on questions of diversity and wokeism. In fact, until we get to the section on Stacey Abrams, I think the only part of this critique that'll spend time on questions of diversity concerns Adira and Grey and that not because I hate trans people or gay people or anything so base as that, but because the writers actually had a brilliant premise with these characters and they squandered it. Again, an example of Discovery disgracing the very causes and issues its defenders claim it champions. We will have to delve into politics when we come to the section on Stacey Abrams, but I think it's fair to say that this is a position we have been placed in, not one we've chosen to inhabit. I've uploaded this section as a separate video, and if you'd rather get straight to it, the link is in the description and the card should be at the top of the screen now. But for now, on with the show. Well, that's a wrap. Star Trek Discovery Season 4 has concluded and my, what a ride it was. The kind of ride you see in Final Destination movies, or the one you're given by Disney employees that you definitely don't remember reading about in the brochures. We've done a couple of videos on this bizarre series already, the sole purpose of which seems to have been to take the worst excesses of thoughtless, faux-progressive gesture politic and put them in the hands of the most superficial activists available. I stress the word activists in place of the word writers, with the aim of elevating bad writing to the level of performance art. The first of these videos looked at what went wrong with the philosophy, the writing, and the characterization. The second looked at the mentality and the market forces behind the series 
in a bid to explain why CBS has been willing to shell out so much money on a show that would be deemed a failure by all the old pre-streaming metrics. Both of these were relatively high level. The tone of this video will, in places, if not in the majority, be somewhat different because here we're going to dive into the show itself and examine the results of their labours. It may at times seem flippant or even glib, but that's because when you actually try and critique or analyse the writing in Star Trek Discovery, you really have to laugh at it, otherwise you'd end up crying blood as your brain is liquidated and begins to ooze out of your tear ducts. This show truly could be the subject of a writing masterclass. Do you aspire to be a writer of any kind? Do you aspire to write things that can be taken seriously by an audience with the average mental age above five years old? Do you want a crash course in things to avoid, mistakes not to make? How not to produce a script that makes about as much sense as a fairy at a funeral? Watch Star Trek Discovery and take heed. Somebody on Twitter encouraged people to send their thanks to everyone involved with Star Trek Discovery. That they felt it necessary to say that negative responses would be deleted and their posters blocked is, I think, quite revealing. But for my part, I'd like to give genuine thanks to the writers of Discovery. They provide a comforting reminder that meritocracy is indeed a myth, and the most talentless, brain-dead hacks in the world can still succeed as long as they make it into, and survive, California. So we'll begin with a recap. It's as much for my benefit as it is for yours. This show is, after all, the equivalent of mid-stage dementia. You can't actually remember very much specific about it, but you're fairly sure that whatever just happened to you left a sour taste in the mouth. We'll breeze through the first half of the season, as we've covered various aspects of its plot in our previous videos, but we will go into more depth from episodes 8 through 12. If you're all ready then... Engage. Disco Season 4 kicks off with Burnham breaking the Kobayashi Maru. Everyone could have died, but they didn't. Because she's Jesus and even God can't create rule sets capable of binding himself, or herself I suppose we should say. Episode 1 was non-stop action with never-present stakes, and the time spent spinning around Deep Space Beta is time that could have been, but wasn't, spent on building up the plotline that is supposed to run throughout this entire season. The Anomaly, the latest anomaly anyway, there are quite a few of these popping up in New Trek, which appears randomly at different parts of the galaxy, destroying anything it comes into contact with. One such thing is Quejan, Book's home planet, which is supposed to be a very sad moment. It is for him, he's an emotional wreck for the rest of the season, which at least marks him out from the rest of the cast, who were an emotionally vapid lot before the season began, and only became more so as it progressed. Episode 2 is entirely forgettable. They go off to learn more about the anomaly, they find it, they stop next to it, they send Book in to learn more about it. The Wikipedia episode guide provides a pretty accurate summary of what happens next. The anomaly inexplicably changes direction and causes damage to the discovery. That's inexplicable in-universe, but out-universe it's what's called a contrivance, a manufactured threat, and we'll see a lot more of this as this review continues. Anyway. The one potentially consequential thing to happen in episode 2 is that the voice in Adira's head that, and I might get this wrong but will risk it, the voice in Adira's head that she talks to and that tells her to do things is extracted and given the synthetic body of a 12 year old child with a blue mullet which is fashion, apparently. I make light of it now, but this has always been the character arc with the greatest potential, the only one, besides Burnham and Book, the show has done anything meaningful to develop since the end of season 2. And it is, conceptually, very interesting. It's probably the most thoughtful approach to issues of identity and gender and personality the writers could possibly have taken. Were this an episode of Old Trek, and it had begun with this premise, I think we would rightly hail it as a moment of Star Trek's typical genius, but unfortunately we are not talking about Old Trek, we are talking about Star Trek Discovery, and the characters in question only have two dimensions when they are fused together. They become entirely one-dimensional once they're separated. And it seems the writers completely ran out of ideas once the separation ritual was completed. Grey's character arc for the next four or five episodes isn't so much an arc as it is an absence. The writers will eventually remember his existence come episode 7, 
When he briefly becomes useful in helping the ship's computer understand its feelings, because this is Star Trek Discovery, so of course the computer has to have feelings, before he is unceremoniously written out of the show. <laughs> and I don't think you can really overstate how abysmal this decision is. With the richness of that premise, to run out of ideas is astonishing. These writers are abysmal. The one half-decent, semi-original idea they had, and they've just tossed it out into space, because they have many more tedious and conventional and unimaginative things to do, and we can't let good character building or storytelling get in the way of all these derivative action sequences and feelings talks the show, well, doesn't thrive on. Now, I did promise we'd breeze through these early episodes, but in the course of writing this review, I found it necessary to come back to this point and make an addendum, because it's not really enough just to dismiss this as bad writing. It's illustrative of so much that's wrong with Discovery, and it's disproof of its defender's contention that it champions diversity and inclusion and all that jazz. I said in the intro that my contention was, is, that Old Trek did issues we now put under the label Social Justice better than New Trek does, particularly Star Trek Discovery. But there is one notable exception to this rule, and that rule concerns gay and lesbian characters. That exception arises not because Old Trek dealt with these issues badly, but because it didn't really do them at all. I am prepared to be corrected by anyone with a deeper knowledge than I have. But to my knowledge, you won't find it addressed at all in the original series. And no, I'm not counting slash fix and other cultural war crimes committed by the shipping community. To be clear, I'm not against you imagining relationships between main characters that don't exist in canon, but I'm very much against you doing this publicly. It's embarrassing. It's cringe. It makes you look very, very weird. Just stop it. The Next Generation is likewise found wanting in this area. There is one episode that comes to mind, The Outcast, which could be read allegorically to touch on issues of sexuality and gender, and Old Trek at its best did allegories well. I'm for more of this approach, not less. But there is a middle ground to be found between punching someone on the nose and feathering, and given this is the only episode of The Next Generation to even think of touching on these issues, again to my knowledge, it must, I think, fall too far in the latter camp. There is a counter-argument, not just from the political right, but from social conservatives of all parties, which runs something like, not every show has to include the rainbow people. And though I'm nominally a rainbow person myself, I am sympathetic to this argument. It's true. Not every story needs a gay character. I'd extend that to say not every story needs a female or indeed a male hero. People are not evenly distributed across society and we shouldn't expect them to be evenly distributed across our media either. People who insist on having gay characters pop up everywhere seldom make the argument that there aren't enough 80-year-old widows in professional basketball leagues, though it seems they have got around to saying there aren't enough men in women's sports generally. But this argument works best for films and single-season or limited-run shows. It doesn't work for Star Trek, which has had many multi-season iterations, and which has always taken this kind of representation as its goal and remit. Gene Roddenberry reportedly wished to tackle the subject as far back as the original series, but was dissuaded by a combination of network and broader societal pressure. Star Trek Discovery, then, had an opportunity to right a wrong. The problem is, it took a New Trek approach to writing that wrong, rather than applying the Old Trek approach to something that had simply hitherto been overlooked. It doesn't feather the issue, sure, but it doesn't even try and strike a balance either. It socks you in the mouth and hopes you stay plastered. The Old Trek approach was, as mentioned, to invite us to philosophize, to ask ourselves questions, to examine our own biases and our prejudices. It generally understood that the best way to change minds is to engage with them conversationally, to approach things Socratically, to pose hypotheticals and abstracted questions, and invite the audience to answer them for themselves, trusting that, in answering them, the audience might recognize some contradiction in their own prior beliefs and worldviews. I say Socratically with a purpose, because this is literally the Socratic method, and we've known of its persuasive and its rhetorical as well as its philosophical merits for several thousand years now. That approach would work as well today as it did back in the day, albeit the issues today are different in degree and sometimes even in kind to the troubles of yesteryear. 
I've said in other videos that gay people today just don't have it as hard as our predecessors even two decades ago. Whatever special interest groups and rent-seeking campaigners might want you to believe, acceptance of homosexuality, and likewise of racial difference, is so much more extensive today than it was even in the 1990s that we born in that latter decade and after it really cannot say we know the world our forebears grew up in. Anecdotal evidence of holdouts and stories of modern prejudice in the West cannot overcome the general picture and shouldn't be allowed to obscure it. But this is precisely why Old Trek's subtle approach is called for, because what issues that do remain are themselves subtle, with the possible exception of transgenderism, given how vast and sweeping and immediate is the perceived injustice, and the implications of the methods sold to us as solutions. Discovery, though, is not subtle. Discovery and New Trek generally do not believe in subtlety, and they demonstrate what you might call the paradox of solved problems. Namely, the more problems that are solved, the more passionately activists campaign as though they haven't been. William Buckley, who has exercised no influence at all on how I speak, parodied it here in his introduction on Firing Line to Thomas Sowell. He is a scholar who has devoted his labors to looking behind the cliches of abjection, to sing out not that there is no such thing as racial discrimination on the contrary, not that there is an instantaneous route to affluence, but that the color of an American skin is not a birthmark that commits him to substandard life. What is extraordinary is that the labors of Miss Sowell, far from exciting the kind of enthusiastic reception one would expect, have met in some cases with near hysterical denunciations, even from some black leaders. It is as if the head of the Anti-Slavery League had denounced Abraham Lincoln for signing the Emancipation Proclamation. Indeed, that proclamation meant that there would no longer be slavery, but it also meant that there would no longer be an anti-slavery league. There are, incidentally, dozens of episodes of Firing Line on YouTube, and I wholeheartedly recommend them. I enjoyed them while I was on the left, I enjoy them now that I'm not. They're an example of conversation and debate done right, one of those rare things that never fails to make you feel smarter for having watched them and, perhaps distressingly, have as much to say about the modern day as they do about ancient history, which only goes to prove that there really is no new thing under the sun. You should definitely go and watch them, once you've finished this video. Anyway, the problem with New Trek's approach generally, and Discovery's approach in particular, is the problem with modern progressive approaches to social issues, in that they not only don't solve the problems already largely solved by better minds, they actually recreate those problems. They recreate them by consciously striving to prove that every slope is indeed a slippery one, by displaying the kind of excesses social conservatives once had to invent, and by turning what used to be a campaign for privacy and equal protection under the law into public displays of vice accompanied by demands that public policy grant them special treatment. From the old, some people are gay, get over it slogans, we've now strayed to, I'm queer, suck my lady dick. This isn't a gay-specific point, it applies to Discovery's general approach to diversity, but since the gay bit is the one I'm most intimately familiar with, I'll restrict myself to that. There is a difference between being gay and being gay. To be more specific, there's a difference between being gay and being queer. One being a mere sexuality and the other being a sexual identity. Discovery isn't solely or even mostly responsible for eliding this distinction, but it's a symptom of that distinction having already been alighted. And this makes it both necessary and difficult to persuade people on the political right or social conservatives more generally that they shouldn't refer to gays and lesbians as living a lifestyle, which is an old and legitimately offensive canard, assuming as it does that we do what we do because we choose to, as opposed to because we feel attraction, and importantly, love, in exactly the same way as anyone else with equivalent, which is to say, no choice in the matter. It's necessary and difficult because the queer and alphabet activists who claim to speak for us do allow for lifestyle queerness and do accommodate people who choose a label to describe their identity, and these are all vastly, vastly different things that a lot of us have no time for. Recent and well-publicized polls showing a vast uptick in the number of young people defining themselves as in some way queer miss this important difference. You'd expect a general increase precisely because of the gradual decline in genuine bigotry and prejudice mentioned earlier, but a large chunk of this is almost certainly made up of people who see in queerness 
a political and an identity label that they'll find just as easy to shake off as it was to apply, once they've grown up and decided that they no longer have any need of the social status it affords them with their peers and in the media. The political term requires very little investment for very immediate rewards. In my personal experience, bullying in primary schools remains a significant and probably insurmountable problem, but once you reach high school and certainly university, the stakes are inverted. Identifying as queer, as opposed to actually being gay, comes with certain concomitant social and institutional advantages. This has the effect of cheapening what it actually means to be gay or bisexual or lesbian, because the queer label is a shortcut to attaining social status. It doesn't actually require anything difficult of you. It doesn't actually require that you go through all the difficult business of realizing something true about your nature, and it removes much of the stress and the disappointment, the tension, the letdowns, that almost certainly mean you will at some stage develop feelings for someone who is incapable of returning them. By so doing, it denudes people, both real and fictitious, of character. Being queer is a shallow and disinteresting alternative to being gay. Now, I might only be a crypto faggot, but believe me, I know plenty of full fat gays. I'm not homosexual, Monty. Yes, you are. Of course you are. ...who find all this offensively superficial too. Combined with the fact it's being used by people who very much aren't superficial, who have deep and thought out and pernicious ideological agendas, and the skill to exploit identity politics, and people like me, and others who keep our loves and our politics separate, find ourselves conscripted into a war we have no part in. And as Russia is presently finding out, conscripts tend to be the ones to die first. In one sense, this sense, we are the red shirts of society, which is why I felt it necessary to go on this apparent digression. I say, apparent digression. Here, though, is why it's all relevant to the subject of our video. There are people in our audience who lean to and vote to the right, or who would consider themselves to be social conservatives, yet who still feel that old Trek speaks to them, because it does. And I'm sure some of you don't get or get on with or approve of the whole gay thing, who find it a bit icky and maybe even who think we do choose to be this way. And I'm taking this opportunity to say no, in fact, we do not. You might be stuck with your wife, that does not mean we choose not to be. As Christopher Hitchens put it, definitely not an influence either, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, homosexuality isn't just sex, it is love. The Old Trek approach could have set all this out on screen and saved me the bother of writing it down. The New Trek approach compels me to write it down. Discovery takes the view that being queer, the unearned veneer of being gay or lesbian or trans, is the only thing worth knowing about a character which explains its botched approach to Adira and Grey in particular. Again, it set these characters up very well. It's the delivery that's so astoundingly shallow, which is how you can tell that the writer's sole aim with these characters has been to sock the political right in the face. They're advocating queerness, and queerness is fundamentally lacking anything like character or personality. So, when it comes to actually fleshing out the lives, the experiences, and the personalities of Adira and Grey, Discovery is completely incapable. It's so incapable that it yeets one of them from the show at the first opportunity. Their combined arc has trace elements of a very good idea. Their premise, two people psychically conjoined, requires a payoff once they are separated. What does that separation actually mean for them? When one changes body, what are the implications for the other? How do they come to terms with this newness? How do people cope when something that seems so foundational to their relationship is changed? A change one is invested in, but where the other bears the costs? I've known a couple of people who've been in relationships with trans people, one of whom only admitted it to themselves after that relationship had begun, which caused complications, as you might imagine. But you don't need to take it from me, there are plenty of stories out there of people in similar positions. When published, these stories tend to arouse quite a bit of shock and more than a little scorn, because the actions of the supposedly trans person – I don't think our definition is anything like strict enough, incidentally – seem so one-sided in their benefits and considerations that they come across as selfish. This is one of the many, many issues society is being made to grapple with at the moment. It's one of those things we really do need to explore and discuss soberly, even speculatively, but certainly sensibly. We need to do so precisely because we are not doing it at present. Largely thanks to political activists, 
who like nothing more than poking the reactionary bear, it's almost impossible to have a measured discussion of these issues. And there are a great many others, too, that demand this kind of treatment. This used to be Star Trek's specialty. But rather than champion reason and rationality, rather than explore these questions with curiosity and courtesy, Discovery takes its lead from, hell, it employs as writers, the very activists who make calm and reasoned discussion impossible in the first place. The type of people who see trans, gay, lesbian and bisexual people as pawns in their grander cultural and political wargaming. So, rather than fulfilling the potential innate to Adira and Grey, the writers take this most fascinating of opportunities and drop it. What the fuck were you thinking? Episode 3 has Burnham solving a refugee crisis. And they do some more sciencing to shove the Sisyphean rock that is the anomaly plotline forward a few inches. Episode 4 has Michael Burnham solve Brexit, recognizing that only she, of course, is able to bring the new Federation and Navarre together because the Federation, like the actual European Union, was making utterly unreasonable demands and trying to chain Navarre by the ankles and throw away the key. Navarre was, as the UK should have been in the 1970s, reluctant to shackle itself to a bloated bureaucratic monolith ruled by distant and self-righteous technocratic wonks. But because this is Star Trek Discovery, and Discovery otherwise likes the idea of a universe ruled by distant self-righteous technocratic wonks, the writers decide that the problem can be solved by the creation of another, even more distant, technocratically wonkish committee. We propose a committee, independent of Federation leadership, to conduct regular reviews with all member worlds. On which Jesus, naturally, who else, generously offers to sit. I will be the bridge between you until you no longer need it. She's Jesus, she's Michael Burnham. And Jesus doesn't need qualifications because she has emotions of a power level Goku couldn't have hidden. say about his power level it's over 9,000 what 9,000 this posed all manner of interesting questions again it's another fascinating premise that old Trek could have done a lot with for example is there any such thing as democracy in this timeline is it wise or sensible to enshrine so much power so many light years away from the people in a committee you might even call it a commission whose members are not elected, and where there is seemingly no mechanism to remove them. What qualifies the members of this committee to know all the goings-on in every region, in every country, on every planet, in every sector of the galaxy they are ruling over? What power have you got? Where did you get it from? In whose interest do you exercise it? To whom you're accountable, and how can we get rid of you? And if you can't get rid of the people who govern you, you don't live in a democratic system. The European Union Commission sits in Brussels, and it can't even manage Belgium. But because these are interesting questions, Discovery wastes not one second asking them. The committee is created, and Jesus is a member, so all problems have been solved. Never mind that Jesus is never once shown doing any work on said committee, because she spends the rest of the season off hunting first an anomaly, and then an estranged boyfriend, showing her customary disregard for the rules she has just nominated herself to enforce. Oh, and Tilly leaves the show. You might remember how Tilly's ambition since the first time we met her was to become a Starfleet captain. Well, the writers couldn't figure out any way for her to get there. I think greater minds than theirs would have struggled to find a way to get Tilly to become a captain. So when a teaching position comes up at Starfleet Academy, they summarily dispatch her. If you can't do, teach, as the old saying goes. Or in Discovery's case, if you can't think what to do with a character, no matter how much work you've put into building them up, ditch them. Episode 5 has more anomabolics to attend to. They find it disappearing and reappearing a thousand light years away just seconds later, which they take as proof that it must be artificial, because nothing in the universe naturally disappears and reappears at will. I have said this before, and I will now say it again. There is so much wrong with this conclusion that it beggars belief. It also explodes what claim the writers have to respecting science. We already know, in the 21st century, that quantum teleportation and entanglement exist. Electrons have been shown to make quantum leaps. Even if we didn't already know these things, 
the logic leap required to get from we don't know what this is to therefore it must have been designed would have given Spock an aneurysm. This is literally the premise of intelligent design theories, the most ironically named theories in the universe given you have to be really quite dumb to believe in intelligent design theories. This show loves the language of science, it loves the esteem of science, but it's elevated the practitioners, the supposed practitioners of science, to the level of priesthood, or mystics making incantations to divine truths about the universe, and this is a consistent problem, it has been, right from the show's conception. I've lost count of the number of deadly and inescapable dangers they found themselves in, only to magically science their way out of them with five minutes of incomprehensible technical sounding gobbledygook. It's incredibly easy to write this way. For example, couple the minge mop with the quantum lettuce matrix and recalibrate the Freddie Mercury array, diffuse the meatloaf orb with the Vorshian pedo shield frequency, then ingest a Viagra miscule crystal and pew, pew pew pew, look at the lasers, there's lasers, there's lights, there's lasers and spaceships. And we've solved the problem by the way. This is a particular problem in a show which is supposed to be thoughtful, because this takes the place of actual meaningful plot lines this manufactured threat in every episode, which must be scienced out of within the space of five minutes, speeds things up but actually empties the show of any meaningful kind of content. And it's a very easy device because it is such an easy device, the writers have far too easy recourse to that device, to the long-term detriment of the plot they are writing. And also, it has to be said, it wrecks show continuity given that the crew who've deduced that nothing can disappear and reappear except by design, have themselves accidentally disappeared into alternate universes and reappeared at random. They know mirror universes exist, so they know that things that might seem to disappear might in fact be going somewhere en route, and they know that it can occur by accident, and they know that it can occur naturally. Wormholes exist, and they exist naturally. What's that you say? Bad writing in Star Trek Discovery? Well, it's, it's unbelievable, but it might just be true. Speaking of things randomly appearing, a morally dubious character magically appears to drive the plot along, and he has ulterior motives for helping them solve the riddle of the anomaly. But we won't get to these for a while yet because the show realizes it's gone more than five minutes without giving an offensively simplistic moral lesson on one of the great crises of contemporary society so it has Jesus take a detour in order to lecture us on criminal justice reform and the evils of private prisons. I need to remind you that wherever you find a new home, you will be arriving as a refugee, seeking shelter and grace. I hope you find a more just society than the one you had a hand in creating. Episode 6 should be taught in writing schools as a textbook example of what contrivances are and why they suck harder than Nancy Pelosi on her dentures. They enter a subspace rift to study the anomaly, get stuck, try to jump away, but can't. Then, Book hallucinates pseudo-memories of his father, and gay scientist discovers that the hallucinations are being caused by some kind of bullshit barrier at the edge of the galaxy. Now, you might think that my hasty summary is leaving out important details that were they included, would make all of this make sense? The answer is yes and no. The show isn't quite as unreasoned as this. The subspace rift has been left behind by the anomaly, though that is about the extent of the explanation that goes into it. Subspace rifts do have precedence in Old Trek, especially in The Next Generation and Voyager and I think Deep Space Nine as well, which is where we learn that they are created by excessive exposure to warp energy. But these episodes take rather more time to explain and explore things than Star Trek Discovery does. Thought goes into their construction. In Discovery, things simply happen, often without much if any explanation at all, solely in order to drive the plot along and pad it out with peril. We spend no time at all asking why, or how, the anomaly could or would create such a rift. Is the anomaly travelling at warp, or otherwise generating warp field energy, which is the established way subspace rifts are formed? It doesn't seem to be travelling at warp, given the speed, or lack of time, it takes to get from one place to another. Then the ship's computer gets too stressed to do its job, and seems to be angling for sick pay, until Grey helps it calm down and it decides it can get them out of the rift after all, but 
only in a very dangerous way that could kill the crew, because moving through the rift is dangerous. Book's hallucinations come about when he attempts to mushroom jump the Discovery out of the rift, which mindfucks him for reasons that are once again inadequately explained. The next generation did feel it necessary to explain the interaction between warp drives and subspace rifts, even if the deployment of the rifts themselves, as an analogy for environmental damage, strays rather close to the nose. Discovery, though, is hampered by its premise as well as its general approach. Mushroom jumping is a new technology, so there is no established mechanic to play off, and the writers deploy two explanations for their troubles in this season. They have the Star Destroyers on Exegol problem of not knowing which way is up, but we also learn, though I think this comes somewhat later on in the show, that there are regions of space or subspace where the mycelial network that Drive relies on does not exist which only reminds us how silly the premise of mushroom jumping is to begin with. Brian Fuller has his merits, but his obsession with mushrooms, also present in one of the stranger episodes of Hannibal, isn't one of them. And then, of course, Discovery's general approach is to introduce and then dispense with serious threats in five-minute intervals, on the belief, shared with J.J. Abrams, that pace can compensate for a lack of sense and sensibility. The Rift also eats whatever happens to enter it, again for Nebula's reasons. I don't believe the Enterprise was eaten when it entered a subspace rift in the next generation. As is invariably the case, its own problems with the rift were dealt with rather more methodically and sensibly, as was the eventual solution. But because the theme of this episode is contrivance, this inexplicable setup is only really put in place because there is no other threat in this episode, and the writers don't think the fans could cope with a gap of more than 30 minutes between perilous action sequences. So the crew gets placed in a pattern buffer, i.e. the energy state you enter when you use a transporter, and this will keep them safe. Like the subspace rift, this also has precedence in Old Trek. The premise, as I understand it, is that once someone or something is in the pattern buffer, it exists as energy, and transport can no longer be interrupted. You become essentially an attached file in a sent email, and you can't be recalled unless the sender is using Gmail and press the button in the 30 second time window allowed for regret. Scotty puts himself in one to survive a crash on a Dyson sphere in the next generation, and we'll have cause to remember it later on, but we'll get to that. Anyway, if the show were any slower, you would likely have time to question whether, if being placed in this buffer can protect you against the universe itself, it mightn't have other very useful applications. Happily though, the show doesn't give us time to think about any of this, so we don't get to ask any questions the writers didn't bother to ask themselves. But because this all seems too easy, they also decide that the ship's computer cannot fly itself out of the rift, so somebody has to stay behind and face near certain death in order to pilot the discovery. Naturally, Jesus offers herself up, and so naturally she does not die. The show has a problem with this, because it keeps putting her in such improbable, implausible scenarios from which death is a near certainty and then having her escape them, that every time the next one comes around, or by the time the next one has come around, you find yourself somewhat desensitized to it. Obviously it's not that threatening, because if it were really threatening and if someone were really going to die, it wouldn't be Jesus in that situation. So her presence actually doesn't quite take you out of the show, but it does divest the show of many of its stakes. Despite finding herself in real extremis, and Jesus has time to talk to Zora about its feelings as they escape the rift, surrounded, because this is Discovery, in fire and explosions. Episode 7 takes what would have been a fascinating premise for an episode of Old Trek, questions of sentience of what constitutes life. Federation law prohibits the existence of sentient AI, and so Zora, having finally joined the rest of the cast in being overloaded with feelings, could well be killed, or rather not killed, but extracted. Old Trek could have spun this debate out over several hours, making thoughtful, informed, well-researched, moral, philosophical, and technical points in order to come to a resolution. Old Trek was dialectic, the debate would have been the point of the episode. But Discovery is to Old Trek what a cheap hooker is to meaningful and loving intercourse, and lacks the wit or the intelligence or the patience to pull this off. Probing Zora's mind, they discover it has memories, and those memories are all about how much it loves the crew, how strongly it feels for them. And so, based upon no legal or other standard I have been able to deduce, they decide that it's not a sentient AI at all, but a new kind of life form, 
thereby missing the whole fucking point of the sentience question. Honestly, if I hadn't committed to getting through this part of the recap with relative haste, not that you would tell, but believe me, you will eventually, I could go on at length about how insultingly stupid this is. This show betrays every one of the values and ideals it pretends to hold. It is a superb example of the superficiality of modern intellectuals and the modern cultural elite and the modern man who enjoys the things that they produce. The show isn't so much shallow as it is dried out. Its writers are fools, and they take the audience for fools as well. What's that thing Obi-Wan famously said? Who is more foolish, the fool or the fool who watches Star Trek Discovery? And this particular subplot, properly understood, is the example par excellence. It is just fucking abysmal. The writers should be ashamed of themselves. Anyway, because Zora has been classed as a new life form, all the concerns they previously had about a self-aware entity with complete control of all the ship's systems and a proven ability to disobey orders just disappear because they all feel very strongly that they can trust her. If these writers had written 2001 A Space Odyssey, Hal would have won. The writers give an unsubtle and unwise reference to Hal during the escape from the rift, when Zora feels parts of herself being dissolved by space cancer and needs Jesus' reassurance, calling to mind Hal's my mind is going moment. And then she sings Jesus a song as thanks. It is not, however, Daisy Daisy. But this is unwise precisely because it invites the comparison. 2001 doesn't explicitly debate the question of Hal's sentience. There are barely 10 lines of dialogue in the whole film. It can't explicitly debate that concept. But it doesn't need dialogue and exposition to have us wondering and asking the questions for ourselves. The result is that Hal, the motives of which are never truly explained, at least in the first book and film, nonetheless has a much, much superior character treatment than Zora. The film credits the audience with enough intelligence to fill the silence. It invites us to philosophize. Discovery is, nominally, a much more didactic show. It's never silent. It always tells us. It tells us everything. It has characters explain every feeling they are having in any given moment. It repeatedly has them explain the setup of the episode over and over and over again. And yet, for all its words, it has nothing to say. 2001 has us ask of how, what the divide is, if indeed there is a divide between a sentient machine and life as we know it. Discovery's treatment of Zora has us ask, open-mouthed, how the fuck the writers can get away with pretending things are so simple. Why? Why am I sentient? Well, you are self-aware. Ah, that's the second of your criteria. Let's deal with the first, intelligence. Is Commander Data intelligent? Yes. It has the ability to learn and understand and to cope with new situations like this hearing yes what about self-awareness what does that mean why why am i self-aware because you are conscious of your existence and actions you are aware of yourself and your own ego commander data what are you doing now i'm taking part in a legal hearing to determine my rights and status am i a person or property and what's at stake my right to choose single data and forgive me commander is a curiosity a wonder even but thousands of data isn't that becoming a race and won't we be judged by how we treat that race now tell me commander what is data what is he a machine is he are you sure yes you see, he's met two of your three criteria for sentience, so what if he meets the third? Consciousness, in even the smallest degree. What is he then? I don't know. Do you? Do you? What are we looking at? It's Zora's subconscious. I think they may be... dreams. These images are window into what she values and prioritizes. Connection. Love. This is who she is. 
Can all AIs dream? None of them can, not unless they've been programmed to do so. We've lost intelligence! I repeat, we have no intelligence! Perhaps artificial intelligence fails to fully define me. How would you define yourself? I am also more than the sum of those parts. Like an entirely new life form. Yes. And this is where I belong. It's my official determination that Zora is indeed a new life form. It feels marvelous. What does? Being seen. You're an imbecile. The other baffling thing is, as we'll come on to see from Zora's near-perfect absence from the rest of the series, why they bothered to create this new character when they clearly had so little use for it beyond this episode. The other pathetic excuse for a moral debate concerns the anomaly itself, which they have decided, for the dumb fuck reasons set out previously, must be artificial. Because it's artificial, it must have been made. Made by unknown species 10C, the location of which Zora was able to provide them with once it had got over its emotional problems in episode 6. Zora has the additional advantage from the writer's perspective of having the sphere data integrated into it. The sphere data was used liberally in earlier seasons whenever Discovery needed something to happen that hadn't previously been set up, properly explained, or adequately explored. But given the extent of its knowledge, it's actually quite remarkable how rarely it has popped up in season 4. Its knowledge is not made redundant just because they are several centuries into the future, given the scope of that knowledge is supposedly both vast and deep. Not that you'd guess from watching the show, but you might remember being told it over and over again in season two. Yet once again, the writers show they really do not know what to do with the past events that they themselves are responsible for. The number of characters built up and discarded is only matched by the number of quite consequential ideas and devices built and then discarded. The debate is the classic debate between the Hawks and the Doves. Michael Burnham and President Clinton want to talk to Species 10C, book and morally dubious character, want to blow it up using a weapon morally dubious character has promised to pull out of his ass, sorry, no, to science into existence. We learn later that he himself has knowledge of alternate universes, and remember when I said that nothing randomly appears except, oh you know what, just don't, just fuck it, don't bother remembering, it's not going to do you any good at all. Morally dubious character needs the power of the anomaly to get from where he is now to this alternate universe and rejoin heavily implied boyfriend who has left this universe for that universe for circumstances in circumstances unknown for now and spoiler warning for a long fucking time anyway we've at least developed to the point where maybe gay characters aren't automatically presented as moral paragons a morally dubious character really does have quite a lot of potential his backstory is complex his motivations are at least they could be endearingly captivatingly tragic and likewise is morality. Which doesn't bode well, given this is Star Trek Discovery, and if you ever equip a character with this kind of ammunition, the odds are they will be written out of the show in a particularly unsatisfying way. And it doesn't start particularly well, because when he is first introduced, they spend precisely 30 seconds on his motives, because all he's really here to be at this point in time is a plot device. The Doves win, but Book and morally dubious character decide, nah, fuck it, we're blowing it up anyway, so off they go leading to episode 8. In order to conjure the superweapon from his ass, morally dubious character needs some contrivance crystals, and they are only available on the black market. Jesus, however, knows which black market dealer book will use, because of course they spent time together as pirates or something, leading them to a discount version of a Star Wars cantina run by a man whose head doubles as a mining implement. Both book and Jesus arrive at roughly the same time, and Shovel plays them off against each other to determine who will win. Jesus' marginally less stunning diverse female sidekick tries to win credits by beating the shit out of an evil white man in an MMA fight, the first couple of rounds of which she loses before deciding that actually she is Neo after all and wins. What point were the writers trying to make with this? I wonder because it's so very subtle. Book, meanwhile, has to try and capture a cheater in the casino who turns out to be Zam Wazel, also from Star Wars. Changely. Because both Book and Burnham inconveniently complete their side quests at the same time, Shovel decides the only fair way to determine who will get the contrivance crystals 
is to play a game of Yu-Gi-Oh. Jesus tries to act in this scene, which is enough to put off the other two players in the game, a couple of emerald chain goons conjured into existence at that precise moment, in order that the writers can have Book and Jesus work together. Because they love each other, remember, and it's supposed to be heart-rending seeing them torn apart by their contradicting motives and desires. They send the goons to the Shadow Realm and then they play each other. Book summons Exodia and wins the card game, but Jesus sneakily puts a tracking device on the contrivance crystals. Charts reveal the existence of something called a hyperfield beyond the galactic barrier. Can the makers of Mass Effect sue yet, cause Species 10C is beginning to look an awful lot like the Collectors. The tracker will let Jesus follow Book to the Omega Relay, and then the plot will be found again. The hyperfield is also artificial, and data, data in this series, is a stand-in for actual information the writers couldn't be bothered to dream up in advance, shows it is powered by Boronite, which is at least a semi-pleasing callback to Star Trek Voyager. But whatever pleasure you might take from that reference is quickly destroyed when, via another stupendous leap of the imagination, they decide the anomaly is in fact a mining tool used by the collectors to secure said Boronite, which causes all sorts of problems. President Clinton reasons, if reasons is the right word, that the anomaly is therefore the collector's power supply. Gum used to seal crack in cooling tower. I'm as shocked as you are. Plutonium rod used as paperweight. No, oh, now that shouldn't be. Yeah, well, that's always been like that. And attacking it would be interpreted as a hostile act, which would be bad for the Federation, as if the collector's mining equipment can blow up whole parts of the galaxy, any military equipment they have would presumably be more deadly still. Therefore, Book and morally dubious character risk triggering the collectors and must be stopped so that negotiations can take place instead. But it immediately begs the question, don't the collectors know what their mining equipment is doing? Surely they must know it's destroying whole planets. They can't be advanced enough to build it and to use it while simultaneously not knowing how it works or what it does. In which case the only reasonable conclusion is that they don't give a fuck. So what precisely is to be gained from negotiating with them? You can't just turn up and say, Oh, by the way guys, bit awkward, but your intergalactic Minecraft machine is wiping out our planets, and then expect them to respond, Ah, shit, my bad, we had no idea, hyper-intelligent race though we are. Well, you can't expect that if you also expect this show's plot to be at all consistent, but I think we've established by now that consistency brings Discovery's writers out in hives, so I'm sure this is exactly what will happen. That brings us to the mid-season break, and so to the end of part one of this review. I hope you've enjoyed it thus far. Besides our live streams, which we now aim to do every Friday, and which allow us to indulge the theory that length matters as well as girth, this constitutes our first longman-style video. It wasn't intended as such, as you might have gathered the script evolved piecemeal over the course of season four and was originally going to be a standard length recap chock full of scorn and mockery. But though our subject is Discovery, our broader theme is still Star Trek, and it seemed wrong to fight Discovery on its own level. Star Trek is supposed to get you thinking, it's supposed to get you talking and debating, and it's my hope that this critique better honours its legacy than does Star Trek Discovery. It's something I intend to do more of. We can't leave Mauler to shoulder that burden alone. Part 2 is already scripted, and much of the footage has already been put together, so my hope is that we'll release within a fortnight. Admittedly, when we first started this channel four odd months ago and I first touched video editing software, I assumed this process would get quicker as I became more familiar with it, but in fact, the opposite has been true. The more you learn, the more you realise you can do, and the more time you spend doing it. I dread to think how long these videos will take to produce once I really know what I'm doing, but as I say, part two is already well underway, so a week or two to finish it off is probably realistic. If you've enjoyed it thus far, do please like, share, subscribe and leave a comment. It's good for the algorithm, but more importantly, it lets us know we're actually giving you something you want. This format is new to me, so I'm sure there's plenty I could have done or could do better, so do please let us know via the same means, and I'll do my best to incorporate your myriad teachings in future projects. As for those future projects, besides part two of this critique, 
There's one of similar length in the works looking back at the Book of Boba Fett and all the many ways that went catastrophically wrong. My aim is to have that out to coincide with the release of the Obi-Wan series in May. We'll continue our critique of Picard with a shorter video come the close of Season 2. I'm not sure yet if we'll cover Strange New Worlds, as I'm wary of getting Star Trek fatigue. There's also the new Doctor Strange and Thor Love and Thunder to look forward to over the next couple of months. I use the phrase looking forward advisedly, and we'll definitely be reviewing those. Other than that, we'll be continuing our weekly live stream on Fridays looking at the news and current events, and I'll continue to appear on other shows that'll have me, most frequently Mr. Brown Alliance, which is a brilliant channel with an excellent panel that goes through movies on Saturday nights and chats media news on Sundays. Link in the description. But for now, this is Lost Chord of the Little Platoon, hopefully not the last survivor of Star Trek Discovery, signing off. <laughs>